What do you say they had a chance to rest their brains? So um, I guess the contrast is this is a chance to tire or weary your brains. <laughs> okay, challenge. <laughs> but the opposite of rest is exhaust, right? Uh, I see, I see, I see. Okay, so this is the fourth of six talks. Let's follow the same procedure. If you've got questions as I go along, feel free to um, raise either your right or your left hand. Uh, couldn't care less and uh, ask, uh, ask a question. And once again, these topics were suggested by Abe. Where's Abe? So, <laughs> um, so, so he's the one who sort of set the syllabus, OK? You, you get the point. <laughs> just as we who are Christians cannot discuss justice without discussing the relation of justice to the love <clears throat> for the neighbor that Jesus enjoins on us, so too we cannot discuss justice without discussing the relation of justice to forgiveness. Those two topics, justice and love, and justice and forgiveness, are of course connected. Forgiveness is a manifestation of the love that scripture attributes to God and enjoins on us. And furthermore, as I observed in my second lecture, the Swedish Lutheran Anders Nygren went beyond that <clears throat> and held that not only is forgiveness a manifestation of love, but that all of God's love ought to be viewed through the <clears throat> lens of forgiveness. I don't know if you notice some of the implications of that. that. That really means that, well, basically that Negrin has no doctrine of creation. I mean, you can't understand God's <clears throat> love in creating the world is forgiveness, obviously. And so basically he's got no doctrine of creation. That's one of the implications of insisting that God's love always be viewed through the lens of forgiveness. So you cannot discuss um, justice without discussing, <coughs> discussing its relation to love. You cannot discuss love without discussing its relation to forgiveness. And in turn, I think it's pretty clear you cannot discuss forgiveness without discussing its relationship to punishment. So that's the discussion issue for tonight, justice, forgiveness, and punishment. It's way too much for one talk, way too much for one talk. So it's going to be, well, we'll see. First, I'll say something about forgiveness, then some comments about punishment, and then some comments about <clears throat> how the two are related to each other, forgiveness, punishment, their relationship. If you have read around in the 20th century literature, philosophical and theological literature on forgiveness, you will realize that there is no consensus on the nature of forgiveness. It's a subject of huge dispute what forgiveness is. <clears throat> so there's no option tonight but for me to explain all too briefly my own view without getting into all the alternative views. Start here. As I mentioned in one of the earlier lectures, I think everybody would agree with this. <clears throat> you cannot just distribute forgiveness hither and yon. Marco, I think I'll give you some forgiveness. Um, I mean, makes no sense. Forgiveness presupposes that somebody has wronged somebody, deprived her of something to which she has a right. Forgiveness presupposes that some injustice has occurred. And it furthermore presupposes that the one doing the forgiveness 
recognize that an injustice has been done. If you don't notice it, you can't. The thought of forgiving just doesn't occur to you. Some injustice has been done, some wrong has been done, and the forgiver notices that a wrong has been done. So let me now present in two stages what I think forgiveness is. The first stage will consist of the context in which forgiveness can occur. And the second stage will consist of saying what forgiveness does in that context. So first the context that forgiveness presupposes within which something that you can do and then what it actually consists of within that context. I think forgiveness has five, I think the context has five components. You know, if I were younger and were doing PowerPoint, I would have put this on a PowerPoint, but, um, but I'm not younger, so. Um. <laughs> so I think, I think forgiveness, I think the context that forgiveness presupposes has these five components. And I'm going just to use a fictional figure, Hubert, here to, I don't have any actual Hubert in mind, just a fictional Hubert to make it a little bit more concrete. I mean, philosophers would typically do this in terms of X's and Y's and Z's, but um, why not Hubert? So I can forgive, I can forgive Hubert for the wrong, for the wrong he did me only in the following context. First, Hubert did, in fact, wrong me. <clears throat> That's one. Two, I, rightly, I correctly believe that he's wrong, blamable for wronging me, responsible for wronging me. I correctly believe that he's blamable for wronging me. Third, I feel resentment or some similar negative emotion at what he did to me. Resentment or maybe, you know, I don't hang on resentment, some, something in the region, some negative emotion in the region. I'm mad about it. You know, resentful, well, you know, you name it. At the deed done. Four, and I feel anger at Hubert. I don't just feel upset about the deed, but I feel upset. I feel anger or something like that at Hubert for having done it. Three, I'm upset at the deed done. Four, I'm upset at Hubert who did it to me. And five, I remember what was done to me. Haven't forgotten it. I remember what was done to me. And I remember who did it. And I continue to condemn it. Haven't changed my mind. I remember what was done. I remember who did it, Hubert. And I continue to say it was wrong. So I think those five components. Hubert did wrong me. I correctly believe that he's to be blamed for doing that. And third, I feel resentment or something like that at the deed done. Four, I feel anger or something like that at the doer, Hubert. And five, I haven't forgotten about it. I remember what was done, I remember who did it, and I remember to, con I continue to condemn it. So let me elaborate those a little bit. I can forgive the second one. I can, give, I can forgive Hubert only if I rightly believe, correctly believe, that he was blamable, culpable for what he did. If I instead excuse him because he didn't know what he was doing, he did it accidentally, he did it under duress or whatever, then I don't blame him. I excuse him. 
But excusing is not forgiving. If you excuse them, forgiveness is not in the picture. Right? So part of the context is that he's not to be excused. I put it the other way around, that he's to be blamed. He can't beg off by saying, well, I didn't know what I was doing, or I was forced to do it, or, or inner dynamics made me do it. And uh, uh. So excusing, as we'll see, excusing is quite a bit like forgiving, but it's not forgiving. Next this. It seems to me if I've been wronged, but I experience no negative emotions of any sort, either concerning the deed or the doer, then forgiveness is not really in the picture. I mean, the picture I get here is some, some, some upscale arrogant person who, who, who says, look, I can't be bothered with insults from scum like you. I just can't be bothered with it. If somebody says, I can't be bothered with what you did, you're beneath, you're beneath my attention. To say that, you're beneath my attention, I'm simply going to ignore it. That's not forgiving. It's, I don't think in English we have a good word for it. It's just dismissing, um, you know, whatever. And of course, it's one of the traditional attitudes of the aristocracy towards the non-aristocracy. And look, I, I can't be bothered with scum like you. Put it like this, I think forgiveness can occur only when the deed and the doer are treated with moral seriousness. And moral seriousness requires some sort of emotional affect, some sort of upset. Otherwise, well, you can't be bothered with it. And last point is this, concerning this, explaining the four or five points of the context. I can forgive Hubert for what he did to me, only if I remember what he did. And remember that it was he who did it. And continue to condemn it. Forgetting, whether because I actively put it out of mind, or because it just fades away, forgetting, is not forgiving. I think sometimes people confuse the two, but to forget, forget it about it is not to forgive. So forgiving is not to be identified with an English letting bygones be bygones, you know, just sort of letting it disappear from, oh yeah, now that you remind me, yeah, I guess Schubert did do that, didn't he? Yeah, well, you know, I'd completely forgotten about it. Um, Forgetting is not forgiving. Okay, yeah, Kurt? Um, you talk about C, right, number three, I guess, in a way that would only be negative. But what about either doing it act more actively, positively? Like a rich person, I can't be bothered with you, your negative thing you did to me. But just somebody who, in a healthy manner, says, I, I also I don't have the emotional desire nor energy to, you know, yeah, that person insulted me or bothered me, but I just, I'm, I'm moving on, I, I can't, it, you know what I'm saying, in a way that's... I think, uh, I think that's more like putting it out of mind, deciding, right. do, forgetting about it, so just putting it out of mind. So I think putting it out of mind is not, for, not forgiving. I think forgiving is much more active. Um, so, yeah, so an ordinary person can also say, I just want to, I don't have the time. It wasn't that big of a deal. Wasn't that, yes, big, of, was wasn't that big of a deal. <laughs> wasn't that big of a deal. I've got more important things to tend to. Uh, let, let's, let's just forget about it. Yeah. There is a proverb, I cannot remember which proverb it is. But I think it goes a little bit like this in English. It is for the wise to ignore the offense. It's for the I'm translating no, it's, okay. it's for the wise to ignore the offense. Like there is this strength of character 
when we choose not to dwell on the resentment, we, it's a positive emotion. We put ourselves above, and that, according to this verse, is a wise people. How does that fit in your so, so the ancient Stoics thought that the truly wise person, they always said wise man, and they meant male, uh, the truly wise person could not be bothered with, could not be bothered with any sort of wrong, would be above them. Yeah, but this is in the Proverbs. What's that? In the Proverbs. In the book of Proverbs. The book of the Proverbs. Do you think the Proverbs, do any of the Proverbs say that? Do many of the Proverbs say, put yourself above it? No, this particular verse that no. I am recalling. Yeah. Well, so, <laughs> so, so probably, so there was a German philosopher, Hannah Arendt, a uh, German-Jewish philosopher, Hannah Arendt, mm -hmm. who argued that Jesus introduced forgiveness into, into the the thought of the world. That's there. You can see what she's getting at, but uh, I think the, she didn't quite get the right fix on it. I think actually what happened was this: in the Old Testament, God is the main forgiver, not human beings. So Jesus didn't invent it, but what Jesus actually does is take what the Old Testament says God does: God forgives the sinner, and now says that we are to do it. So, so, so with that adaptation, I think Hannah Arendt, A-R-E-N-D-T, Arendt, Arendt, she's right in there now. Jesus, Jesus introduces into the world the idea that we human beings are to, be give, are to forgive each other. It's not introduced forgiveness itself. Yeah, just so really quick. Um, just kind of bringing with, with these two a little bit. There is kind of that degree of magnitude, like C.S. Lewis says, you know, if somebody steps on my foot, they did it by accident, I'd probably excuse it. So if they stamp on my foot, they need, I need to forgive them. So there is a degree of magnitude. In other words, there might be a wisdom from the Proverbs and the Psalms that says, you know, pick your hill to die on. You don't have to, you don't have to be offended and broken apart by every single thing that happens to you. Yep. But there are things that yep. do require, there are a magnitude that requires forgiveness, right? Yep. If there's, right. So, so the moral breach has to have some significance, yes. Yeah. Which is if it's just utterly minor. Uh, put it behind you, don't, uh, basically, put, well, I use the generic term, forget. Yeah. Okay, so if that's the context, then the question is, what is forgiveness in that context? So what is it, what is it to forgive Hubert for the wrong he did me? I think it's to act on the decision not to hold it against Hubert in my future engagement with him. It's to decide and, and to act on the decision, to act on the decision, resolution, not to hold it against Hubert in my future engagement with him. Or is this translated uh, in one of Paul's letters, Galatians as I recall, not to, not to count it against him. Not to hold it against him, not to count it against him. It may take a long time to enact, fully enact the decision. In fact, often it does take a long time fully to enact the decision to forgive. Decision is usually not instantaneous. It's often hard work, long work, long work, hard work to actually bring it off, to actually not counter it against Hubert in my engagement with him. And of course, you may also decide to not counter it against him only partially. You may say, well, I'm going to counter it against him and continue to counter it against him in some respects. But in other respects, I'll engage, I won't counter it against him. So the decision may be only partial. And the enacting of the decision may be only partial or long, long range and difficult and so forth. So here's the point, which, which I think a lot of the literature overlooks. Forgiveness, 
Forgiveness is very often partial, not complete. You never intended it to be complete or you did intend it to be complete and you haven't brought it off. It's often partial and it often takes a long time. It's hard work, often, unless it's a fairly minor room. Offense. Yeah, Kurt? Maybe you're going to get here, but last time we talked about this, we talked about, you haven't, you haven't mentioned yet whether forgiveness requires the other person to ask for forgiveness. We're going to get to that. Okay. I thought so. so. That's, that's what everybody wants to get to. I want to get to. <laughs> yeah, Martin? Um, it seems that it's like a decision, but also it's like a process. Yes. So it is like... Ca carrying out the decision is a process, yeah. Okay, so it's like during the, that process, you need to take again and again the decision yeah. to do not... Yeah, yeah. So I picture it as you make the decision then it takes a long time to um, enact the decision, but probably an equally good picture, sure picture. You have to keep deciding. <laughs> You have to renew. You have to renew the resolution. You have to renew the resolution, and you may never get all the way there. And you might always harbor a little bit of, you know, I'm gonna, no, no, I'm gonna continue to count it against him in this respect. Uh, so. so now the tricky question. And what is it not to count it against him? What is it not to hold it against them? So let me try to explain what I think it is by introducing the idea of a person's moral history. Moral history. A person's moral history. Start with this. Many of the things we do make our moral character better or worse. He's a worse person because he did that. He's a better person. She's a better person because she did that. But a lot of things make no difference one way or the other. You did it. But you're neither morally better nor morally worse. I mow my lawn on a Saturday afternoon. I really do it. Yeah. Am I a morally better person? <laughs> Not unless I've been letting it grow weeds and everything and my, and my neighbors are deeply offended. No, I suppose I'm a morally better person for finally having mowed. But ordinarily, if I mow my grass on a Saturday afternoon, that doesn't make me morally better. doesn't make me morally worse. Okay? More than different. That's a fairly trivial thing. But notice excusing. What somebody did maybe may quite seriously have harmed you. But if you excuse the person, that just is to say that he's not a morally worse character on account of it. He couldn't have been expected to know what he was doing. He was driven by inner demons that just drove him to it. Whatever be the reason for the excuse. If you excuse him, you say the fact that he did it doesn't make him worse. I'm, I'm going to excuse him. It's like not a mark on their moral character. It's not, it's not a blotch on their moral character. To excuse is to say it's not a blotch on his moral character. I'm told, I don't know if this is true, that there are some cultures which do not accept excuses. And anything you do that harms somebody is a blotch on your moral character. I don't know whether that's true. All I know is that in our culture, Western culture in general, we accept excuses, excuses. If the deed is to be excused, it just means that it's not a blotch on his moral character. So here's what I mean by, you can almost guess now, what I mean by a person's moral history. The things he did, or she did, let make him or a better or worse moral person. The things he did, she did, that make constitute a blotch on his moral character, or a, what's the opposite of a blotch? A virtue. 
a virtue, a bright spot on her moral journey. Moral history of a person will be the things that count pro or con, for or against the person's moral character. So a person, you might think of it like this. The personal history of a person consists of the totality of things they do. Whatever they did, mowing my grass on a Saturday afternoon, things that I have to be excused for and so forth. Personal history is a, is a subset of that, is, is, is within that. Got the idea? Yeah. But those aren't necessarily absolutes, right? Because in the eyes of some people, certain actions are positive, whereas in the eyes of other people, that action might be a negative for a Yeah, but I don't think it's in the... It's honestly, I'm a, pretty much of an objectivist here. I don't think whether it's in the eyes of people is the... I mean, that's where we start. What do your eyes tell you? But, but ultimately, it's... I think there's a, like, a truth or a truth or falsehood in that. It does it does or doesn't count against the person's moral character. Doesn't it does or doesn't count for or count the person's moral character. And then we get all kinds of arguments about it, yeah. Though I think there's a lot of agreement as to when people should be excused. I mean if they can really make the case that they didn't know. Uh, they could, and they couldn't be expected to know. We all, I think all of us, say that it's a big It's not a blotch on his character. He couldn't have known otherwise. Unless he should have known otherwise. I'll have to count a little bit. Yeah, because sometimes the excuse the person makes makes it, makes it impossible for you to hold them responsible for what was really a moral blotch. Let's say, let's say Nixon and Watergate. No, I did not do anything wrong to subvert the total, you know, bipartisan system, election system in America. Um, you know, what I was really doing is acting in the best interest of the country. And he said, you know, so yeah. he, he excused his created his own, his own excuse, but yeah. but then that all that made his moral watch all the larger yeah. because his excuse, his excuse was so false. Yeah, people are always excusing themselves, of course, but that doesn't tell you that they are, are in fact objectively excusable. Right. So as I say, I'm pretty much of an objectivist. I don't think there's a truth in the falsehood of the mind. But it's not always easy to come by. And sometimes reasonable people will come to a standoff. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But see, what's typical of university students nowadays when we talk when when they we talk about moral matters is that they always like to focus on the gray cases. And then it's the agonies of gray cases. <laughs> <laughs> and I let them talk about their great cases for a little while. And then I, then I just get deeply impatient. No, no, you're this. Okay, okay. Suppose you were a Jew under Hitler's regime. Would you be talking this wish and walking talk, talk that you're talking about? No. Oh, no, 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 no. So it's, they have to be pulled up short. A sort of reality therapy has to be used on them. I know there are great cases, but that's not. Focus all our energy on the great cases. Well, there. Are, right? Is there an excuse for him for having done what he did? No way. He may have done what he did. Okay. Okay. So here's, I think, forgiveness. Well, what I'm trying to explain: what is it not to hold the deed against him? What is it not to counter it against him? You can almost see what I'm going to say. I think it's this. To resolve in my engagement with Hubert, not to treat it as part of his moral history. In my engagement with him, to treat him as if it, uh, here's a better way of putting it. In my engagement with him, to treat it as if it's not part of his moral history. It is, and I know it is, and I remember it is. But I'm going to engage him. Here's a way of putting it. I'm, go I'm going to engage him in the same way that I would if I excused him, without in fact excusing him. To excuse is not to regard it as part of his moral history, right? Just a, it's not on the list. I think to forgive is in that way very like excusing without excusing, continuing to remember that it was wrong and condemning it, 
But to say, Hubert, in the future, I'm going to do my best to engage you in such a way that I don't regard what you did as a blotch on your moral character. I'm going to engage you, do my best to engage you, as I would if I excused you. That's, I think, what it is not to count it against him, not to count it morally against him, not to hold it morally against him. That, it seems to me, is what it comes to. So, in essence, you're saying that it's essentially what God does for us is described by Paul in Romans 5, 6, and 7. And he gives us the example. So when God says to us, Paul, Paul of course, God is saying not, not to hold, not to count their sins against our sins against us. For God to say to us, I'm going to, you, you did wrong. You were both going to wrong. But I'm going to engage you as if what you did does not count against you more. I'm going to engage you as I would if I excused you. I'm not excusing you. It's, you know what? You, you better I know all that. So you're not excusable. King James, I can't remember that word, blotting out the transgression. So, so blotting out. In, so, I, what I'm doing is interpreting the blotting out in Paul's sense of not counting against him, not counting against, not count. So, I'm reading it like this not counting against morally. What is it not to count against morally? It's just like, I'm not going to view it. I'm not going to engage you as if this is a blotch on your moral character. So there's, you could say, is this pretending? <laughs> um, that's a really interesting question. When the state pardons somebody for a crime that the state thinks the person did, is the state pretending? Not really. It's, it's in the region of The crime is acknowledged. The crime is acknowledged. So that's, I think, we're not, we're not pretending you didn't. We're not pretending you didn't do it. But henceforth, but henceforth, hence you're not going to be put in jail for it, and, uh, and given that it's a pardon, it's going to be rubbed off your record and so forth. All the while. And that to me is the difference between that and dismissal. It's like I'm going to acknowledge the wrong. Yes. So here's, of course, the moral question. If that's what forgiveness is, this, this really subtle action while remembering what you were did to me and condemning it, resolving, resolving that henceforth I'm going to interact with you as if it doesn't count more, as, as if it doesn't count more against you, as if it's not a blotch on this more, as if you were not a worse person because of what you did. If that's what forgiveness is, then here's, of course, an obvious question. Why forgive? Why, why try to enact this subtle action? Why forgive? Why not continue to count the wrong against Hubert that he did to me? Why not continue to hold it against him? Why not nurse my anger? Why not resolve that the dastardly thing he did to me, I shall forever treat as a, a, a blotch on his moral character. Every time I interact with him, I'm going to keep in mind, Hubert, you did that bad thing, and you're a worse guy because of it. I'm not going to. I'm just. I'm not going to go through this business of engaging you as if it was not part of your moral history. Well, suppose Hubert has repented. Suppose Hubert has really repented of what he did. He remains blamable. He remains culpable. 
He cannot change that. He cannot undo the past. But he has altered his relation to what he did in a morally powerful way. Previously, he stood behind what he did. I did it, says Hubert. And I meant to do it. Now he distances himself. And he agrees with me now that what he did was a bad thing. He agrees with me. He has repented. So his overall moral condition is different, significantly different, right? Instead of standing behind what he did, he morally distances himself from what he did. And he joins me at that moral distance of condemning it. He joins me in condemning it. I would say that Hubert's repentance, assuming I know about it, is an invitation to me to forgive. It's a serious invitation. invitation. Hubert's repentance, assuming I know about it, is an invitation to me to forgive. But it's no more than an invitation. And we all know that some people refuse the invitation. In the face of the other, in the face of the wrongdoer's repentance, they refuse to forgive. But suppose I'm not one of those. I accept Hubert's invitation that his repentance extends to me. Hubert's invitation to me to forgive. Best word I can think of, invitation. Suppose I accept the invitation. Why, why would I accept it? What good do I expect? And I think the obvious answer is reconciliation. Human reconciliation, absence of, of hostility, is a deep and profound good. And that's what the acceptance of the invite. <laughs> so the repentance invites my forgiveness. If I accept the invitation and forgive, now there's opened up before us reconciliation, true fellowship. When, you know, I don't have to argue the point, when previously there was a blockage between us, a moral blockage. I might have decided to forget, but that's just a different, I mean, that's not dealing with it. That's not really dealing with it. Now there's opened up the possibility of reconciliation. Sometimes it's a fairly narrow reconciliation. The abused wife may think that, I'll keep the same name, Hubert really is sorry for this one act of abuse. But she may also think that he's got demons inside of him that he hasn't yet dealt with. And that it's not unlikely he's going to do the same sort of thing again. So she, can, she and he can be reconciled over this one act. And she's going to be ho she'll hope for greater reconciliation, more extensive reconciliation, I should say. But she won't yet expect it. That's in the future. But often it's, it's not so confined as that. Often it's um, forgiving for this particular act of wrongdoing really does open up the possibility of reconciliation. That reconciliation, I mean, I said that for forgiveness is a process. The reconciliation is a correlative process. It, it doesn't happen snap like that. It's going to take time and effort and all of that. And now the last question that you're all waiting to ask and that Kurt already asked. Should we forgive in the absence of repentance? 
A lot of people read the New Testament as saying that we should. I don't. I do not. Here's what Jesus says in response to some questioning that the apostles obviously had with each other. Jesus must have said you should forgive the wrongdoer seven times when the apostles had some discussion with each other to the effect of, can he, can he, he must have been misspeaking himself. He can't, men, he can't have meant forgive seven times. And then Jesus says, um, 77 times, which is hyperbole, of course. I mean, what Jesus means is forgive as often as necessary. Forgive as often as he repents. 77 times, 277, you pick, your, you pick your arbitrary number. It doesn't matter what number you pick. Um, a lot of people, uh, when I say this, refer to Jesus saying on the cross, as it's translated in our English Bibles, forgive them for they know not what they do. Uh, the, I forget the Greek word right now. The Greek word is, is a fairly ambiguous word. could also be translated, excuse them. If they didn't know what they were doing, Think about it for a minute. If somebody didn't know what he does, what he did, then we excuse him. So I've said. So here's the thesis. I don't think scripture says that we ought to forgive the non-repentant. Let's take it a little bit further. Think about it. Suppose that Hubert refuses to repent. He insists on standing behind what he did. He insists that he did nothing wrong. He did nothing wrong, he says. Now I say to Hubert, Hubert, I forgive you. What is Hubert's response? Is this being recorded? Damn it, keep your repentance. I didn't do anything wrong. For me to accept your repentance is to concede that I did something wrong. And I didn't do anything wrong. I refuse to accept your repentance. That's what Hubert would say, right? I mean, if he continues to stand behind what he did, he's, he's, he's not going to accept the repentance. He can't accept the, re I, the forgiveness, sorry. He can't accept the forgiveness. Now suppose in the face of Hubert's adamant insistence that he did nothing wrong, I nonetheless say, Hubert, in my future in interactions with you, I'm going to treat you as if it's not a blotch on your moral history. I think that's a morally problematic resolution on my part. I think the cleaner moral way of saying we better live with our disagreements somehow and not go through this, I'm not going to go through this pretense of treating you as, as if it's not a blotch on your moral character when you insist that it's a good thing on your moral character. So I think to try, <laughs> to, if you can bring it off, and I'm not sure you can bring it off, if you can, as opposed to forget, you can forget in such a situation, of course, put it behind you and all of that. But in the face of the adamant insistence by the wrongdoer that he in fact didn't do anything wrong, that what he did was a fine thing, to engage him as if it counts neither pro nor con. Uh, when, in fact, you continue to condemn it and he continues to praise it, uh, I think is a morally problematic situation. But let's just leave it there. Those are some reflections on forgiveness, what it, what it is. Yeah. This is, in terms of moral philosophy, just the framework is absolute sum. Take this into the, like, the psycho-spiritual realm. For us, full rights who have that in, in like a Sneeds and his for, forgive and forget where there's that element of forgiveness or uh, Oxford, where they will say there's a spiritual element of forgiveness by which even if that person's done what's inexcusable, if you forgive them before God, God will 
process healing with you and begin to release you from the damage of that resentment and the claim you're holding. So it, it, now, so can we separate this moral theology in the social context from what happens spiritually in a person's relationship with Christ and how we develop in the light of having been a victim? Does that make sense? Um, sure, it makes sense. Um, but I think one's going to tease out the implications of the same ideas, yes. right? And, um, right I, think I mean, uh, you know, there are other things that could be said here. Um, I mean, if one can... So, so, so I've given you a theological, philosophical analysis. There is a competing therapeutic analysis, yes, which is extremely popular. And the therapeutic analysis of forgiveness is, in my view, basically forgetting. The therapeutic, the therapeutic tradition says, forget about the wrongdoer. You've got to deal with your anger. Your anger is eating away at you. Yeah. And you, you, don't, you, don't, you don't have to pay attention. Dealing with your anger has, in principle, nothing to do with the wrongdoer. Um, all I can say here is a third, just two competing traditions. One is that I've given you that I think is right, is a theological, philosophical tradition. The other is the modern therapeutic tradition as to what constitutes forgiveness. I, this was brought to my, I hadn't thought about this, gave a talk to this effect at the University of Virginia. One of the people in the audience was absolutely baffled by it. She said, what? What, what, does, what does the wrongdoer have to do with it? What, what, why are you bringing the wrongdoer into it? you got to deal with your anger. I just, I, she, I was as baffled as she was baffled until one of my colleagues afterwards pointed out that what she was doing was reflecting the therapeutic tradition out of which she came. Um, and which is not a social engagement. It's not an interpersonal engagement. It's, it's me and my anger. I think your foundation is much more solid. I'm wondering how to, if there's a redemptive way to lay this into the therapeutic structure of well, I'm doing some personal work or, you know, I've got, in this world, I've got reasons to be angry with this person. They did something unforgivable. They haven't asked forgiveness. Now, God help me yes. to let go of this for one reason or another. Well, that's to eat me up. Yes, to let go in some sense or other. Sometimes forgetting is, or quasi-forgetting is the best we can do. And we, we have to try to... Thanks for tackling that one. That's get, a get on with it. Yeah, so, so sometimes forgiveness is in the face of adamant, insistent non-repentance. Some forgetting is sometimes what we have to try to do. Forgetting in the sense of putting on a mind, not letting it eat away at us, and so forth. And there, and there the therapeutic tradition would have valuable things to say. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, first get Patty, and then in this process of where do you see, if you do see, or how do you see the role of the victim, the one that has been wronged, in interacting with the one that wronged, in engaging with the if, if the person, the wrongdoer, is not just willing to forgive, what kind of relationship, yes, what kind of relationship that the one that's wronged had in seeking that repentance? In seeking the repentance. So sometimes what... Sometimes it doesn't come, right? Yeah. But I, mean, I visualize it as a, often a complicated, circular process. The victim, so, so it's one thing to be willing to. I think we should always be willing to. And sometimes the, and sometimes the manifestation of willingness to forgive evokes repentance on, it, on the part of the wrong. So I should have made that clear. I think we should always be willing to. Always, always say, if there's some inkling of, of repentance, if there's some inkling of the possibility of reconciliation, I, I, I'm for that. I, whether, you, whether we can bring off the forgiveness itself, but always willing to forgive, and the willingness to forgive sometimes evokes repentance. So it's not just first repentance and listen. It seems to be more complicated with the group. Yes. Indeed. Which is why the Truth and Reconciliation Committee in South Africa is so complicated. 
I mean, that's one person. Clarification question. Okay. So then are you saying that confrontation in order to give that person to the person wronged? Is it responsible to actually confront yeah. in order yeah. to have yeah. yeah. that person determine who the wrong is? Yeah. Um, com so sometimes we'll take a confrontational character, sometimes we'll take a much more gentle non confrontational character. There, yeah, there's, there's got to be on, on the victim's part. If the victim, if the victim can bring it off, I'm sorry, what's my answer? In the case of horrendous, I honestly, the human being cannot bring it off. This is a boy who a human being can bring it off. Um, but so, you know, some kind of willingness at least for that. And just to confess, I can't do it. But, I mean, there are lots of stories that have been. In the face of horrendous crimes, when crime proves truly repentant, um, a lot of people find themselves able at least to go somewhere for it. Yeah. I wanted to point something random, oh, Randy. he said, and because, I don't know, because when you said, for example, that it can be this theoretical kind of like forgetting and yeah, to continue or to pass on, to move on. I think that it could be like something really passive. And when I see like the scriptures in Matthew 5 or Luke 6, it's like, I see love your enemies, do good to the ones to do wrong to you. So it's like kind of more active thing. So I think that I don't need to also, I don't need just to forget, but I need to love them, so yes. I need to <laughs> forgive them, even if they don't ask for forgiveness to me. Do you hear what uh, she said? Um, <laughs> scripture never says forgive your enemies. Uh -huh. No place does it say forgive your enemies. It but says I love your enemies. To do something good. So it should be more than, you're, you're absolutely right, more than a sort of passive. Forgetting, an act of love. And forgetting, maybe forgetting in some cases, maybe part of the act of loving. But I, I find it striking that the New Testament says, "Love your enemies." Jesus, but neither Jesus nor Paul nor Peter says, "Forgive your enemies." If they remain enemies, if they are no longer enemies, that's a different. Offer God's offer. God's offer of justification. I think justification is a, in Paul in Paul's letter to the Romans is a sort of legal par parallel to um, personal interpersonal forgiveness. God offers justification to everybody, and that's like being willing to forgive. But some people say, "No way, I refuse to accept." It. Where, where am I? Uh, Randy. Well, there could no, be not Randy. No. Randy with his hand was up later than mine. Okay, okay, you heard? Uh, Neither was up before me. Oh, there you go. Since last time we talked about this, like two years ago, yeah. this has been, uh, so I want to talk about specific cases, right? So one is the people who killed Dionysio. Right? So lots of people, Christians have said, we have to forgive those people. And forget. forgive. At least forgive. And then uh, we have lots of people in our church, but one of the recent examples I remember is a man who was extremely abused by his grandfather, who was basically his father, and brought him up. Beaten, uh, made to sleep out with the animals when he didn't behave properly, and all sorts, and very alcoholic and lots of violence. So he went out to the community and the pastor and some other people, and he went out and forgave his grandfather before he died. His grandfather asked for, for no forgiveness, 
nor did he recognize that he had done anything wrong, nor did he even respond when the guy said, I forgive you. Right? It was just, I mean, you know, old guy who just doesn't want to talk about it, doesn't want to think about that anymore. So I'm wondering, like, and it does seem to me. Yeah, but I want to ask a fair question. So, okay. so what did the son grandson think he was doing when he was said he was forgiven? That's what I think. So, so like, let's say we we have been wronged, and so, and the other person there does not recognize that they did anything wrong, may stand behind what they did, or maybe say it wasn't me. Or you know whatever it, it's it, it, you know it's uh, lying, cheating, c continuing wrongdoing. They, they start to hide what I call it, they don't mourn and distance themselves from what they did. Right? Or they even you know like the guys who killed the Indians who said we didn't do it. And it's clear they did, but they said so. There's no repentance there. Yep. So then you have I have two options, right? I can or maybe more than two. I can. Uh, continue to hold this against them in a way that uh, somehow can continue to damage me, right? That's this healing thing. Uh, so, you know, angry, hostile, and, and, and that's what I think we're getting at with, like, uh, I'm getting a little bit lost. One option is that I, I treat them as best I can in a way that is healing. So, am I getting anywhere? I thought I was going somewhere, and now I just got lost. It seems, it seems, to, be, it seems to be at a minimum to continue to counter the against mm -hmm. students, continue to think that they're all the worse because of what they're doing. Which maybe is okay, but there is, it's clearly also at some level affecting me. It's not even yeah. helping me. Yeah. So, and while they are not interested in re, uh, coming back in, into a reconciliationship, I can either, so they don't want reconciliation, but I can also treat them with hatred, which will make them, it'll be worse for them, but it'll also be worse for me to let that hatred in my heart. Or I can treat them with love, which is, so now I think this is where I was getting, right? So I can treat them with love, which isn't necessarily the same as forgiveness, but it lets me heal and invites them at some future time to ask for forgiveness, right? So that's maybe the piece that still feels like it's lacking in this discussion. So what would that, what does that piece look like? Don't call it forgiveness. Yeah. So yeah. lots of people have been calling it forgiveness, and if you, I mean, this would be interesting if you wanted to write something more about it, or somebody did, because everybody calls this forgiveness in the Christian literature. You need to forgive that person, even if they don't. But we, if we can make that distinction, it's something different than forgiveness. So, so here's so here's what I should say. The the best rest. The, the best resolution of this conflict, of this whole conflict, the best resolution is that the wrongdoer repents and I repent. Now, if that doesn't happen, then we have to repeat the second best, the third best solution for one reason or another. Because your anger is, is eating away at you. And the other guy continues to. to Stand behind what he did, so then you retreat to semi forgetting, coping with our anger, all such things. But I really think that those are all that's not true reconciliation. It's see, the, what, if, if the ideal happens, he repents, I know I forget, then authentic reconciliation. Then, then, then I'm no longer counting it against him. We, we can go forward. In the best way as possible, in the possible in this And if that's not possible, we, we, we fall, fall back. And it often be important to fall back. And the, and the fall back still involves loving the person. 
Well, it's, it's a well, it's the same. I mean, so, so here's the mystery of it. You love the person while you continue to condemn what you're doing. You don't, you don't cease to condemn what you're doing. I don't think when God sacrifices, God said, I'm going to forget about what you did. God can't forget about what you did. Uh, now, Randy gets to the Randy gets to the house. Possibly it's shrunk, and it's someone first of all in the evangelical sisterhood of Mary, and that's from a group of Lutheran women that rose to prominence after the Second World War, dealt with this a lot. They had women and men, both Jews and, and Christians, who had been subjected to horrors in various camps like Dachau and Belsenburg and whatnot. And unfortunately, some of these people were locals who had been enslaved to work in the camps and hurt other people. Some had been victims in the camp and didn't wander far when they got out. And some of the some of the deposed like camp officers and stuff that, that were the, the evil in the place were living in these towns afterwards too. And they were they were reading the gospel and going, This this sucks, you know, what do we do? We're supposed to love our enemy. And so they looked at some of these these men who had run the prisons that were totally impoverished and they were social pariahs after the war. They were isolated, they couldn't get jobs. And they chose to cook them food and bring them food as an act of love to invite the possibility of repentance. It didn't work with anyone, everyone. But there are stories where the person says, how could you do this for me when I did that to you? And you open that conversation and oh, then you do recognize you did something wrong. Let's talk about that over dinner. But, but I mean, the, so the act of love was radical enough to invite the repentance. Um, and so, but, but I don't know that we're required to, we're to love our enemy. I don't know that we have to go that far in enemy love, but that would be an example. I you're saying to open the door and make it easy for the four. So, 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 so my friend Randy is that love for the enemy always involves willingness, the willingness to forgive upon repentance, and hence the willingness to reconcile. Yes. But it's my view that if, if the other person digs in his heels, we've got to block each other to reconcile. This is a block. <laughs> I wanted to tell you how much I appreciate your elements of forgiveness, particularly number five. I remember what was done to me, and I remember who did it. Because and now, I continue to say it was wrong. Exactly. Because now we're currently in a battle, an ethical battle in Latin America, and many Christians say you just for the victims of the political violence of the 60s, 70s, 80s in the 90s in my country. Christians say you have to forgive and forget. But how can I forgive if my family was disappeared and I don't know who did it? How, in order to actually reach to authentic reconciliation, we need to keep pushing for truth. And then the victims will have an opportunity to forgive. So I'm really, truly delighted that your theory is so clear about the right victims to know who did this run to. Of course, in a way, it was the state of Guatemala that failed the people. The state of Peru, but at the end of the day, the state is this fiction. There were human beings that gave orders, and human beings that committed atrocities, such degree of cruelty, and we don't know who they were. And so, pushing for that truth in persecution, many times it's interpreted by Christians that we keep promoting hate instead of paving the way for reconciliation. Uh, that's a really good point. I haven't thought about it so much. But often we don't know who did it. Often in those situations, we don't know who did it. Or, or, or not who directly did it. Yeah. Uh, to be, the fact that one is wrong produces a moral breach between us. It just does produce a moral breach. And, what, and here's what the Old and New Testament say. One way of, what, what, what classical Greek and Roman thought said is that the way to deal with that breach is to punish. There is only one way to deal with that breach, and that's to punish. What the Old and New Testament introduced is a totally new idea, a new way of dealing with the breach, and that is forgiveness. Forgiveness upon repentance, I think. A totally new way. And people, there are a lot of philosophers in the liberal tradition who to this day are against forgiveness. They adopt the, 
basically they affirm the old right or wrong. Don't have to punish. Um, yeah, I guess <laughs> we still have time to talk a little bit about punishment, I guess. Oh, yeah, uh, Just the example on the, the video that Kiri uh, showed. The video that you saw oh, yes. on yeah. uh, Friday night. Yeah. And, um, the, and Terry was there and somebody asked if uh, the killer uh, of, of uh, her parent did not uh, recognize what he did wrong or he didn't even accept what he did wrong. Just deny and deny and in that case, you know, um, like Terry and others and all of us, you know, how can we forgive him? But then, like I, I also mentioned to you, the, the case of the, the other guy, the other guy, the other guy, as well. And, and he had been convicted and put in jail. But then he's not a Christian. And he's also said that he's a Christian, they should him now. The, the other guy, not not that guy. Yeah. So, so in um, that case, there's some repentance, I think. Well, for him, for the rich guy, he, yeah. for, he accepted his, he did wrong. And he's also, he said he's a Christian and giving his life for the, the trial. He's the first the first guy that has, has been tried, um, they call it the case 01. Mm. He's the mm. first one. Mm. But then this <laughs> other guy, he's actually. Zero two, yeah, he's the, the case zero two, but he, he didn't, he, as you have seen, he just he didn't uh, accept. So in that case, how can all of us forgive him? And then, and then the question of asking Christian, should we be forgiven? So I think, yeah, so my view is that we should always stand willing to. And if in fact there is repentance, then we should work hard to, in fact, forgive. It may be hard work, long work, hard work. But then it's our Christian ideal or duty <laughs> to work towards no longer counting it against him. Because he himself has, has distant, as I put it, morally distanced himself. And that makes, that makes him a different person. He did it. But he's, a, he's not a person who stands behind what he morally behind what he did. He now condemns. He joins me in condemning what he did. That, that's a that's a that's a different feature in the situation. Uh, yeah, and then Samuel. Pensando en el trabajo de violencia contra la mujer. Thinking about the work uh, of violence against women. La sociedad le da el poder al varón. The society gives the power to men that he can damage the woman because he's the boss. He has to control the woman. And in the churches, the women in the churches, they give them <laughs> and the churches, they tell uh, the woman to give good testimony because in that way he's going to change his attitude towards her, towards her family. How to manage that? I mean, that's the right thing to try to do. Es la cosa correcta de hacer. How to manage it. ¿Cómo manejarlo? <laughs> I don't know, what do you think? No sé qué piensa usted. <laughs> bueno, allí es más que la acción de la persona, del varón y la mujer, o la pareja en este caso, ¿no? Es ver todo it's el contexto. The of the woman and the, como, and the, and the man as a couple. Le, is to see the context. Cómo le da privilegios a uno y le resta en, una, en un estado de desequilibrio, eh, de igualdad dentro de la sociedad, dentro de la familia. Es es el contexto que da uh, diferentes niveles de privilegio para las mujeres y para los hombres. Oh, oh. And, uh, in, in, for example, uh, she's telling us that in the family, in the society, uh, men is more privileged than women. Uh, 
and uh, he has a certain uh, legitimate uh, opportunity to uh, do wrong to the woman. So, how do you address that? Entonces, la cultura no señala the culture el doesn't... acto como, algo, como daño que le está haciendo, sino como algo normal, natural. Okay, the, the culture um, gives us the impression that it's not something wrong that the man is doing to the woman. It's something natural, it's something that we should see uh, in a very simple way. <laughs> So there are two questions here, I suppose, or two issues. The first is, I think it cannot be denied that Christianity introduced a powerful egalitarian impulse in society. That we are all, we are all equal in God's sight. And that should produce a profound equality amongst each other. Not necessarily that some people don't have positions of authority and so So my view is that the Christian gospel pronounces judgment on any such society which says these people, men, whatever, white white men, are allowed to do things that these other to these other people and they're not allowed. That these other people are not allowed to be men and women, or in my country is white, African American, and so forth. But of course, you, of course, your other question is how do we move towards such a society? And I, I suppose there is no general answer to that. Each, each society is. In, in, in my country, 30 years ago it was, of course, whites and people of color, and so it was a civil rights struggle. But that would not necessarily be the case in your society. And in almost every society, it's been men and women. Now I have Samuel. Yes, my question is a situation where uh, this repentance, the person has person distance himself or herself, but then you reconcile, but then the existing institutions and set of affairs remain the same, which means the person will still continue to benefit from the historical injustice that's what built through the wrong that were done. So there are a lot of times where people can accept responsibility, they can ask for forgiveness, but it stops there. But what people are really, some people are dealing with the historical yes. injustice that are built in the institutions yes. that continue to function. So I've actually been talking more about interpersonal relationships and social, social structures. Yeah. 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 And a full discussion was get on to the social structures, actually. Okay. Oh, Jill, then Marco? Marco's first. Jill's first. Um, so I, I really like a lot of this, and I, I've been very attracted to the forgiveness theology of Miroslav Wolf, which I think is similar to this, but I'm wondering if you agree with him on this, and maybe it's just semantics with the way we're saying it. So he says forgiveness is like giving a gift. Yeah. Um, that one person says, I would like to give you this pen, and that's what the Christian's responsibility is, and he calls that to forgive. That you extend the offer of, I would like to give this to you, but that forgiveness doesn't reach fruition until you repent and accept the pen. I, I would call the offer of willingness. So, so it's just the difference between calling it willingness to forgive. So how active is willingness to forgive for you? You, you would communicate to the person that you are willing and would like to forgive. That was my question. Oh, sure, question. The responsibility. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, the person may be at a great distance or whatever, but often it should be a very active willingness. Okay. Making it very clear. I stand, I stand willing to forgive and to be reconciled. So then, yeah, it's just a semantic. Which actually opens up another opportunity for, for damage. Yeah. Right. Yes. Oh, so yeah. Yes. Yeah. Even as they've reached adults, you've still got the damages. But then they you come mean, back and say, screw you. 
You mean in this sense, oh. first problem. Yeah. Take and then reject. The victim makes it clear that he's wanting to forgive, and then like, the other guy slaps him in the face and says, Need your forgiveness. I refuse your wrong. Now you have two wrongs. And of course, uh, as, as I said before, for the wrongdoer to accept the offer is for the wrongdoer to concede that he did something wrong, that there's something that needs to be forgiven for. So, you know, there's, there's, I didn't do anything that, for which forgiveness is appropriate. You, you only forgive somebody if they wrong you, and I didn't wrong you by it. I treated you in a way. I guess in, in that case, I don't, have, I don't mean to cut. In, in that case, I'm wondering, though, and Karina sort of helped me sort of think about this for a whisper a minute ago. There are things that before Christ was in my life, I did, and I had no idea that I did wrong to someone. That, that was something I shouldn't be doing. And so I'm wondering, just to sort of tease this out a little bit, um, the for, does the forgiveness that if, you know, if I truly offended Marco by throwing a wooden snake at him from here and today, because I had no idea that he was three years old, he was bit by a snake, and, you know, and, and he came within an inch of death because of, he was bit by some snake, I don't know. But, like, is the, is, does forgiveness look different, first of all, between ourselves versus ourselves and God? And then also, does that forgiveness look different if, and again, I don't mean to, you know, to, to, to give anyone an out here, but... I, I truly, I truly think, I, I feel great regret for some of the decisions I made before Christ. But at that point in time, I mean, I don't know that I would have had this paradigm of forgiveness in my mind to say, I need to go up to Mark and say, you know what, Mark, I had no idea that at three years old, you were bit by a snake. And that, you know, you know what I mean? Yes. I'm throwing that in. So, so it seems to be Jeremy, the word you use is absolutely the right word, regret. Even, even if you, you wronged somebody, harm them, but you didn't realize what you were doing, what, whatever be the reason, you can still regret deeply. You didn't, you're not blamable for what you did, but you can regret deeply. So re a full discussion of this would talk about the relationship between forgiving and repenting of having blamefully done something wrong and regret. It's typical of nations to rarely be willing to go beyond regret. Rarely to be willing to apologize. An apology amounts to saying, I did something blamefully wrong. Regret is just... I guess, I guess, the, difference be, I guess the difference between um, repent and regret it was never so clearly brought to mind as when Claire and I were just for the first time in Virginia, um, Charlottesville. The church we were going, the church to which we which we were attending, Christ Church, Christ Church Episcopal, was having a big dispute over the following. When when school integration was ordered in the States, the church tried to avoid it by starting in a basement a school exclusively, a private school exclusively for white people. And now, 30 years later, whatever you may 30 years later, there were people in the congregation asking that the vestry apologize. The most the vestry to apologize is to say we, did, we recognize that we wronged you. The most the vestry was willing to say was, we regret that we were insufficiently sensitive to the feelings of the black people. We regret that we were insufficiently sensitive to the feelings of the black people. Well, that's... I suppose that they were really sincere about that. They regret it. Regret it insufficiently. Regret it that they were insufficiently sensitive. But that's not, that's not conceding that they did anything wrong. And so, and so forgiveness 
the stone of decision <laughs> to expressions of regret. I don't know how you respond to this question. So Michael had this terrible experience with snakes when he was three years old. And now you're with him and you see a wooden snake and you dangle in front of him. And he's frightened out of his wits. So he almost has a heart attack. <laughs> but, um, but does the you idea... express regret once it all becomes clear? Well, well now we're on the same trip. But, but if, if, for example, we're assuming that everyone has this, this, that everyone understands this idea or this paradigm of forgiveness as we do. <laughs> Or is that totally not even? We all have a moral conscience, so therefore we should know. Uh, yeah, okay. So the ancient Greeks and the Romans have no, no concept of forgiveness. They have, they have no concept of forgiveness. Someone cannot assume, I mean, that's a really interesting question you're raising here. Someone, so it's a mistake to assume that every culture has a concept of forgiveness. What I've been assuming is that our Western Christian Hebraic culture does have a concept of forgiveness, and that it comes out of our, our Old Testament and New Testament heritage. I think what I've been I think what I've been giving you is the heart of that theological, philosophical tradition which has its roots in the Old Testament and the New Testament. God forgiving the sinner, Christ saying, forgive your neighbor as often as the neighbor repents and so forth. But the rest of the picture is that in the 20th century, there emerged an alternative idea. It was also called forgiveness, which is the therapeutic idea, which is not an interpersonal business. It's each dealing with their So it's an interior. Um, so what I have to say is, when you press me on it, is not not every, not every culture has any idea of forgiveness whatsoever. And our own early 21st century has, it seems to me, at least two competing basic ideas. One is the one I think that comes out of the first community scripture, and the other is the one that comes out of the modern third community. That makes it all <laughs> complicated. But, where am I? Yeah, I just it popped to my mind uh, that verse Jesus saying when asking for forgiveness, forgive them because they do not they don't know what they are doing. And then Stephen quoting the same verse as Jesus said when actually the the evildoers were beating him in he was dying. So they don't ask for forgiveness. And they would not repent for what they were doing. So I'm just trying to figure out if, if repentance is uh, needs is like a requirement. Just just I don't know what you're quoting those. So suppose we have a distinction between excusing and forgiving. When somebody doesn't know what they're doing, they really don't know what they're doing. And let's add this, and they're not responsible for not knowing what they're doing, because sometimes in the law, at least in ordinary culture, you can say to the police, well, I didn't know the law, and then the police can rightly say, you should have known the law. So it's non-excusable ignorance. If it's not, if it's excusable ignorance, you didn't know what you were doing, and you couldn't be expected to know, then I think you're excused. Because then you, you're not blamable. Right? I can't blame you. I excuse you instead of blaming you. And if I don't blame you, I can't forgive you for what I blame you for. So I just think that to excuse and to forgive are, are two different things. I think what Jesus is saying there, they don't know what they're doing. They're not to be blamed. To be excused. They just don't know what they're doing. And what's assumed is that this innocent ignorance is not Now, now I'm Joe, and Samuel. Oh, yeah, Samuel, go ahead. Yes, because of the example you gave in Virginia, do you think that? 
we should take seriously the question of power and privilege in this discussion because it seems to me like people who are very powerful and have privilege find it very difficult to have humility sometimes. And so while they are not really apparent in the discussion, but I think at some level it becomes really very, very important because even I think powerful people are people who are privileged find it more difficult to distance themselves from the yeah. story. If, if you repent just to humble yourself, and powerful people find it very difficult to <coughs> humble themselves. Yeah. I mean, repentance is, is a humbling. It's a moral humbling. Yeah, I think you were getting here, but I just kind of wanted to push you to go there. Is uh, Where does punishment fit into this <laughs> Um So... What are you up for? Um, <laughs> a discussion of punishment? 25 minutes. How many minutes? 25 minutes. Until eight. You're psychologically up for 35 minutes? The schedule is up for 25 minutes. So let me say a few things about So let me say a few things about punishment and then maybe tomorrow morning talk about the relation between forgiveness and punishment. So, what is punishment? I think anybody would agree with the following. It's pretty black. Punishment is imposing, I'm going to use a nuclear term. Punishment is imposing hard treatment on somebody because of the wrong thing they do. Punishment consists of imposing hard treatment of some kind on somebody because of the wrong they do. If you're willing to accept that, I think most people are, the definition of punishment, notice this, punishment is backward looking. The imposition of hard treatment because of the wrong he did in the past. Okay? So I think punishment is inherently backward looking. We impose hard treatment on people for forward looking reasons as well. We impose hard treatment because of some good that we expect will emerge in the future from the hard treatment. And the three classic goods that are mentioned are maybe the hard treatment will reform this person. Hence, we in the States used to talk, in the United States used to talk about reformatories, penitentiaries, make people make them penitent, and so forth. And that's, that's a future good, right? That's a forward looking good. So maybe sometimes hard treatment is imposed in the expectation it's going to reform the person, make the person better. Secondly, sometimes it's imposed as a device for deterring such, that kind of behavior by this person in the future or by other people. Deterrence. So you've got two so far, reform, deterrence. And third, some kinds of hard treatment are imposed to protect the public against this supposedly dangerous person. Only some kinds of hard treatment are relevant to that, like incarceration and exile. Fining them isn't going to do much by way of protecting the public from this. But those are the three classic goods that are cited as achievable by hard treatment. You reform the wrongdoer, you deter such behavior by that person in the future and by other persons. Uh, 
secure, make society secure against this really bad uh, thought. So I, I think people who thought hard about it would say that those are not, strictly speaking, punishment. They're forward-looking instead of backward-looking. That punishment itself is this backward-looking, hard treatment for the wrong. Of course, you may do it for both reasons, right? You might, you might do it both as punishment to, to achieve some future good. So back to punishment. So the big question is, and what, why would you, why do you want it, what's the sense of imposing hard treatment on somebody because they did something wrong? What's, what's the connection? What's the connection? And the dominant answer, which goes way back into the Greeks, is that you do it for retribution. Here's the idea. In this bad act, one party benefited, benefited and the other suffered. Right. Now the ancient idea is that things ought to be balanced. Again, so this is a crude statement, but I'm all right or not. Or anybody thinks you asked me. You know, even things. I mean, the root idea is. The balance, restore the balance. The ancient Greeks thought that the whole moral order of the universe was upset and that it had to be restored. The balance. Most modern thinkers don't quite think that. They just think that the balance has to be restored. This was Aristotle's theory of punishment. Equality, equality has to be restored. Retribution, payback. Um, getting you, redressing injury, all those express the same way. And the idea is that there's a deep moral requirement for restoring the imbalance of the world. So now let's do some biblical exegesis. Um, I typed out some scriptural passages and she'll, she'll disappear. Oh, there she is. Yeah. Matthew 5, 38 to 48. Uh, this is either from the re I mean, there are this whole flurry of English contemporary modern translations. Uh, this is either from the Revised Standard Version or the New Revised Standard Version. RSV or NRSV. You have heard that it was said, an eye and an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you. I think what's implicit there is whether or not they can repay. I think that's implicit. And do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you, whether or not they can repay. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your enemy, not your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say that you love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of our Father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. That's actually on the deep, I also realize on the things. For if you love those who love you, what reward? For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do that. And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you 
Are you doing another? You don't even the Gentiles do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now here's Luke reporting the same episode. But I say to you that listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, or for the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, don't withhold even your shirt. Give to everybody who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, don't ask for them again. Don't ask them back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do that. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies, do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Heavenly Father is merciful. So there's been oceans of controversy and discussion as to what Jesus meant by Matthew 38 through 42. Uh, do not res uh, 39, rather. Do not resist an evil doer if somebody hits you on the right cheek, turn the other cheek if somebody wants to sue you and take your coat and so forth. And the counterpart passages, passage in Luke 6, 29 through 31. Lots of controversy about that in discussion. Some of it fascinating controversy. I think the context here, the, 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 what it all leads up to is this declaration on Jesus' part. Do not return evil for evil. I think what Jesus is doing here is rejecting what I have sometimes called the reciprocity code. The reciprocity code. The reciprocity code is all throughout pagan antiquity, and it's obviously also in, in the Jewish background. Here's what the reciprocity code says. Return good for good. good. Answer favors with favors. That's the positive side of the reciprocity code. The negative side of the reciprocity code is return harm for harm. And behind that is to, to bring, either way, to bring things back in balance. Here it seems to me is Jesus' attitude towards the reciprocity code. Toward the positive side, return favors for favors, good for good. I see Jesus as sort of shrugging his shoulders and saying, yes, yeah, it's by and large a good thing. It's no big deal. Gentiles do that. Sinners do that. Pretty much everybody thinks that if somebody invites you over for dinner, it's good to invite them back for dinner or bring a bottle of wine or some flowers or, um, you know, the answer, good deeds with you know, pretty much everybody. There's a parable Jesus tells in which Jesus, in effect, says, but don't make it an iron rule. In Luke, Jesus goes to the house of a Pharisee one Sabbath. Uh, and all kinds of things happen. First, there's a person with dropsy, and Jesus heals the person. And Jesus, uh, blood disease, and Jesus looks around. Says, anybody ready to criticize him? No. And, and, then, and then Jesus criticizes the seating arrangements. You know, in the 19th century, there was the idea of Jesus meek and mild. This is not a meek and mild. Um, so you invite somebody over for dinner and they look around and they criticize the seating arrangements. And Jesus says, you know, 
Um, you've seated the important, he's speaking to the host, you've seated the important people next to you. I think you should seat those at the bottom and you should seat the less important people up next to you. Okay. And then Jesus goes on to say, and furthermore, I don't like your invitation list. Um, I think you should have invited the people who can't return the favor. The blind and the halt and the so forth, who can't return the favor. Um, so you see what the import with respect to the reciprocity code is. Yeah, it's by and large a good thing. But don't let it become a rule so that you only give favors to those who, who can answer with favors. Don't, don't let it become an iron rule. With respect to the negative side of the reciprocity code, it seems to me Jesus says, no way. Do not return harm for harm. Under all circumstances, love your neighbor. Return good for harm. And Paul says the same thing in the 12th chapter of Romans. Um, let me give you the specific reference. Romans 12, 17. Paul says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Repay reciprocity. So what about the idea of retributive punishment? Retributive punishment is the imposition of harm in response to harm, evil for evil. Jesus repudiates the reciprocity code. So I think there's no conclusion for you and me as New Testament believers to draw other than that Jesus repudiates retributive punishment. Repudiates the idea of paying back evil for evil to balance things off. He just says, return good for evil, and Paul repeats it. I don't see any other way of, and, and those much disputed passages, I read them, I read them like this. If, if you're willing to accept what I've suggested is the general context which, which, which Matthew and Luke give here, then here's what Jesus says. If somebody strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. Don't try to pay back. If somebody wants to sue you and takes your coat, give them your cloak as well. Don't try to pay back. Don't try to get even. If anyone forces you to go one mile, volunteer to go the second mile. Don't try to pay back. If anyone begs from you who you think cannot pay the loan, give it to them. I think here's the continuation. If somebody takes your credit card, offer them your bank account. If somebody takes your bicycle, offer them your car. Get it? Don't pay back. Metaphorical. <laughs> Hyperbolic. But why shouldn't we allow Jesus to speak in hyperboles and metaphors? He did all the time, of course. I think, I think these are metaphorical, hyperbolic, extremely colorful ways of saying, don't, don't pay back. Here's the question that that leaves. Does that mean that punishment is out? I think it means that retributive punishment is out. But here's another account of punishment that is much less prominent. Let me first start with an example. When a parent punishes the child, 
Unless there's something profoundly sick in their relationship. The parent doesn't think of this as paying back. Right? The parent doesn't think of this as getting even. The parent doesn't think of this as retribution. The parent doesn't think of this re as redressing injury. Unless there's something deeply, something deeply sick. And sometimes, you know, you read stories about wealthy people, the wealthy old man is getting even with the young, with the young son, who's, and so then you get getting even. But otherwise, so what's the idea of parental punishment? I think the basic idea is to reprove the child. A forceful way of saying to Johnny, look Johnny, what you did was wrong. And it was fascinating to me that when she gave her impassioned talk Friday evening, Terry, actually, without, I mean, just blurted it out, she herself said that punishment is a forceful way of saying, of condemning what was done. She didn't use the payback language. I don't know if you noticed it. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I was alerted to it. And unless you're alerted to it, it probably passed you right by. I wonder if we ever record, probably not, right? But uh, that's how she expressed it. So I've had to coin an English word, reprove, as a sort of correlative to retribution. It's not an English word. I invented it. I call this the, the reprobative theory of punishment, coming from reprove, reprobative. And scripture is filled with actually the injunction to reprove. Um, in the passage that I read from Leviticus, about when I read it the other day, Leviticus 19, verse 18. This immediately precedes the love command. Here's what God says through Moses. You shall reprove your neighbor, or you will incur guilt yourself. Showing forcefully to the neighbor, whatever, that he, he or she did something wrong, is for the good of the neighbor. It's for the moral good of the neighbor. So I think what, and interestingly, when Paul talks about the function of the state in Romans 13, Paul never uses payback language. He does not use the language of paying back, of retribution. What he says is that the state shall express its condemnation of what the wrongdoer did. So I think we Christians should I think what Jesus, I think what Jesus says is, uh, does is repudiate the retributive theory of punishment, the payback, and opens us up to this alternative, what I call reprobative theory. Punishment is a forceful way of saying what you did was profoundly wrong. And often you go, you have to go beyond words, right? To um, so then the question that remains is. Um, but that's too much for tonight. If that's how to think of punishment, and we open up to questions here, how does punishment so understood relate to forgiveness? So anybody, I mean, you're gonna do that tomorrow? Yeah. What's the difference just quick between, did you say one of the things, there are three reasons to punish and the first was reform. What's your idea that's the difference three between? Reasons, three reasons, I, I said the, those are not strictly speaking punishment since they're not backward. What's the difference between reform and reprove? To reprove, I mean you may, often we reprove in the hope of reform, but reprove is just to express strong condemnation. Mm -hmm. Expre the, the strong expression of condemnation. Well, I mean, when, when reproving takes the form of punishment of the imposition of prior treatment, it involves a very strong expression of disapproval or condemnation. Mm -hmm. We often typically do that with a formal in addition. Reform 
maybe neutrons. So I think we should quit for tonight. Let me just put in front of you one particular thing that we'll talk about tomorrow morning. Um, so I think an implication of the New Testament is that punishment is not obligatory. If the person, if the person has already expressed repentance, punishment is not obligatory. Whereas all of antiquity, and let's face it, a great deal of the Christian theological tradition, assumes that punishment is obligatory. Assumes that God must punish. I satisfy justice. Or some just, yeah. I think that if the person is fully repentant, then full forgiveness says why should I subject you to hard treatment? What? Unless it's one of these good. That's for tomorrow. We'll talk a little bit. I forget what the main topic is for tomorrow, but we'll talk a little bit more. You can raise questions for well.